it's 49ers cover two time. This is going to be super exciting. Warren, how's it going, everyone? Welcome, Warren, to the show. This is going to be a fun one. I'm looking forward to this episode. Man, looking forward to it, too. I mean, it's been a while since uh, the draft party, man. It's been a while, so it's it, man, but I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, it's been a while since we've got your opinions on 49ers football, and a lot has transpired over that time. Uh, you know, the Warriors have had some injuries, of course, which you can see the topic right here in the middle between us, the impact of Jimmy Ward. I think it's perfect that our episode, or I mean, that the show is called 49ers Cover 2 because Jimmy Ward's a safety, and, you know, he has a lot of a lot of things that he does for this football team, and it's going to be a little bit different without him out there. Warren, what do you think the impact of the Jimmy Ward injury is going to be on this team? And, you know, there's, there's conversations about him possibly being out four to six weeks. When do you expect him to come back? Man, there's two ways for me to look at this. Um, I want feeling. I mean, so the first way you can look at it is I feel like we're thin at safety. Um, you look at behind who's behind Jimmy Ward. You have uh, I believe it's Odom George. Yeah, George Odom. George yeah, Odom. and then you got uh, Tyler Noah Hufunga, who's been what? Well, this is really going to be like his first year starting at safety. So I mean, this is really going to be like his rookie year, to be honest. Um, as we all know, Tart walked away. We lost Tart. Yeah. So and then um, Tavarius Moore, and Tavarius Moore, from what I've been hearing, this has been best camp since he's been with the Niners. Um, but we've seen what happened and what transpired in the Green Bay game. He got beat really bad for that touchdown. So I'm kind of worried just because how thin we are, the depth right. we're at safety. So I, if we get to Week One and Jimmy Ward's not there, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, to be honest, I'm gonna be worried. Um, the second way I feel like you can look at this is I feel like this is the time of year where there's a lot of mysterious injuries. You know, players get hurt. Um, injuries pop up out of nowhere, like, how did this guy get hurt? You know, and, I mean, those of you that watch basketball, I feel like there's a lot of load management going on. So I don't know if some gamesmanship is going on right now with Jimmy Ward. I know you've been at camp. Yeah. So, I mean, you can speak on it better than I can if you really was hurt, like, what's going on. But um, to me, how I feel, honestly, I think he's going to be there. I'm, uh, it's week one, we play Chicago. Yeah, I do think they want to have reps for other players at safety, but they could have just sat Jimmy Ward the entire time without him actually having to practice. He's looked fantastic. Right. Uh, you're right about Tarverius Moore. He's had himself one heck of a training camp. But you're right. When he got into the zero cover situation against uh, the Green Bay Packers, he did not look good in that situation. Now, I don't think he believed Romeo Dalbs was just going to run right past him. I mean, you know, because Tavarius Moore still believes he's that 4-3 guy that was coming out of college, right. that he could turn, flip his hips, and run with Dalbs. Of course, you know, a deep fade is a tough pattern to be able to stop from the slot. I mean, there's just so much space for that wide receiver to be able to get to the back of the end zone. But that's tough. I think Tavarius Moore needs to step up. Now, I have been on record because I went on Twitter, and you know that's record. And I said that I believe that the 49ers could get through the first two games with Tarverius Moore and Talano Hufong as the starting safeties for this reason. Number one, they're playing the Chicago Bears. Now, Chicago Bears, besides Darnell Mooney, don't exactly have a wide receiver that scares me. Correct. Um, so I think the 49ers corners with Tarverius Ward and Emmanuel Mosley can do most of the work. Hufong and, and Tarverius Moore can kind of light people up, you know. Uh, so I think that's one thing. Plus, you got Justin Fields, who's a young quarterback still trying to develop. Then the second week against Seattle, who the heck's going to be their quarterback? Because unless it's Jimmy Garoppolo, I'm not exactly worried about Geno or about Drew Locke. Those guys don't scare me at all. And I think the the kind of the way the schedule works out, the Niners might actually look at that and be like, you know what, let's keep Jimmy out for two games, make sure he's healthy. Because really when you need him is when you're going mile high against Denver. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I hope he I hope he's going to be ready for one. Um, but like you said, I mean, you make great points. I mean, for the first two weeks, you're really not going to need him. I mean, week one, you're going up against Justin Fields. I mean, yeah, he does. I, I, I mean, I watch a lot of college ball, and last year, he does push the ball downfield. He does. He does push the ball downfield. So that's something that, I mean, they can game plan for that, especially if they know he's going to be out, you know, week one. Um, they can game plan for that. They know that Jimmy Ward's not there. So. Yeah. <clears throat> one thing to take into account, too, is Dante Johnson. I mean, Dante Johnson might actually make this roster, of course, dealing with, you know, the rib cartilage injury, but he, he'll probably be ready to go. And that's a natural cover guy at the free safety position. So maybe they go with a combination of Tarverius Moore, Dante Johnson, you know, and uh, Talano Ufonga to be able to 
bridge the gap. That's all it's about. Get through those football games. They don't have to be pretty. Just make sure you win them because, I mean, really you want Jimmy Ward to be able to stay healthy. And he had injury concerns through the first part of his career, yeah. but really he stayed healthy pretty much since then. Yes, he has. He's been healthy. Uh, he's been one of the most healthiest players in the roster of late. Yeah. Um, but this is why I miss Tart. You know, because if, if Jimmy Ward would have went down, I mean, you just plug in Tart. I mean, Tart knows the defense. Um, he's been in that position before. He can shine in that position, and somebody you can trust in. So with losing Tart to me, it was it 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 it's big in a situation that happens like this in the situation where Jimmy Ward gets hurt. Yeah, you're right. I mean, and I didn't want to lose Tart either. And he yeah. didn't really get paid a lot of money by the Philadelphia Eagles. It was a decent upgrade, you know, as far as pay. But you're right. I mean, that's one of the things you run the risk of is if you lose a player at the caliber of Tartan, I think where they're really going to miss him is actually in run fits. He was fantastic in that area. But you're right. Now, I mean, now they have question marks. Now, they, I think they do have a lot of belief in Talon Ufanga. And from everything I've saw, he's been that guy. But he's a strong safety. He's not going to be a guy that's expected to do the things Jimmy Ward does. So it's going to fall on Tavares Moore. And I honestly just don't know if George Odom can fill that role. To me, he's kind of more of a strong safety as well. So it's it's a little bit interesting, the safety room. They're going to play some Quantreds night as well at safety uh, during the Minnesota game. So that will be something to watch. D'Amico said he was getting some work in, enjoying practices. And then, of course, my guy Taylor Hawkins out of San Diego State, who I'm very high on. I want to see his reps because I believe he could also do it. I just don't think he's going to make this roster because when it comes down to it on August 30th, you probably want to keep Dante Johnson because of his versatility. Exactly. Uh, and I think that's why they ended up letting go of Darquist and Nard. And that's a good good, good segue there because we're going to be talking now about the 49ers cuts. Uh, that was really an interesting thing. The Niners go from 90 to 85. And some of those names, you know, I mean, of course, you had uh, Denard. You also had Kendiche, Josh Hockett. I mean, those guys right away. Then you have Keyshawn Johnson who got claimed by Atlanta. I believe Hockett went to the Cardinals. Those guys are already on the move. You know, and then you had, uh, of course, the guy, the USFL legend, Tomasi Lalele. Oh, wow. Um, he was also released as well. <laughs> so those are the five guys. Did any of those really surprise you? Or did multiple of those guys, multiple of those guys surprise you? Um, the one that really stood out to me was the Dark, uh, dark West Denar one. Because going into the season, we lost K1 Williams. Yeah. And so we had a we had a glaring need at the nickel position. Um, as we know, as we've seen against Green Bay, Sam Womack bought out. He did. I mean, the guy... He put his name on the map. Everybody who's a Niner fan knows who he is. Yep. I mean, even uh, who Tyree Kill, he was tweeting about he him. Was. Yeah, yeah, so um, he, he definitely balled out. Um, Dark was the nerd. It saddens me because I watched him a lot in college. He went to Michigan State. You know, he was a star in Michigan State. He was a first-round draft pick. Yeah. And I absolutely loved him. And to see him bounce around the league, um, and now he gets to the point where he's with the Niners. And I thought he had a good shot to making the team. To be honest, yeah, and then now to see him where he, he got he, like, he gets cut, like honestly, that it saddens me. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to Denard, actually, I from everything I saw at training camp, it was on target in my belief to start at the nickel corner spot. I thought they were going to go with him and allow Womack to be right. able to develop, and then they released him. It was very surprising to me. And then Kyle Shannon kind of said, like, hey, maybe we'll see Denard again, you know, maybe, maybe we'll see him down the road. So I think the 49ers will be willing to bring Denard back. But he made the statement that he wanted to see the young guys get reps. And I think, you know, seeing the way Womack played, I think, was exciting. But seeing the way his understudy, uh, also the, the third guy, Quantrez Knight, looked, I mean, Knight had a lot of really positive plays in the game. And he's a guy that I've seen flash in training camp. And then all of a sudden, they give him these extra reps at joint practices. And the second day, he has an interception picking off, you know, the quarterback. And then they're talking about him playing corner, I mean, uh, nickel corner and safety, talking about how he's good against the run. Uh, I think those are exciting things, but now it's going to be Womack and Knight that get those reps uh, during the game, and I think that's going to be fun to watch because I don't think anyone really knew who Knight was. Uh, he was just somebody that I've been really hyped on. I've been going on to John Chapman's Patreon and telling him, Quantrez Knight, Taylor Hawkins, and I just love that finally Knight's getting his opportunity. Right, and, and Knight, I didn't really know too much about him as well, or Womack. Well. Yeah. But from what I was hearing is that our scaling team was on him. They are one of the one of the first, I guess, the only scouting team that was really pounding their fist about. It. So, I mean, it's good to see um, pretty much the fruit. What is it? The fruit of their labor. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> um, got it. Yeah, the fruit of their labor like come to existence. You know, like these guys are out there scouting. They're doing the best they can to get the best talent in the draft. So, what they found in Womack, I mean, if he continues at this pace, what he did against Green Bay, we're all going to forget about K1. 
<laughs> right, and that's 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 difficult to say because right. the shark was flying around. Um, the one thing that's going to be interesting that's a little bit of a difference between what Womack does and what the shark did. The shark was, even though he was undersized, he was tremendous against the run. He was yes. a great tackler, and he also one of the best blitzers on the entire team. Absolutely. Uh, Womack has that speed and that aggressiveness, but right now I haven't seen him be able to do the thing and, and run fits. Now, he's a willing tackler, so he's going to go in there and he's going to get after it. But I think understanding where you're supposed to be, squeezing off certain things. Also, when you go up the field, sometimes you're the, you've are you got to cut it off. You've got to set the edge. Those are things we need to see. And D'Amico said in his press conference, he said, yeah, we need that guy to be almost like a linebacker because they got to be able to be good against the run. It made me think something was wonder if they're going to go with three safety looks on early downs because they were playing Denard on first and second and Womack on third. What if they release Womack because they're going to end up playing a Jimmy Ward, Tarverius Moore, um, or Tauno Hufanga in the box on those situations, play them in that nickel corner spot on early downs when it's more likely for a team to run, and then on third down bring in Womack to be able to do the coverage skills uh, and cover and lock people down, which he's really good in man. It could be a way for them to approach defense this year getting the most out of the talented players that they have. That's, that's an interesting take on it. I would love to see the Niners do that, to be honest. Because, uh, I mean, Hufunga, you could play him in the box. Right. He's almost like a – he's a safety, but he's a linebacker. Yeah. And he'll come he up and he'll hit you. You know, um, I've seen some encouraging things about him uh, over the past couple of days where he's been talking a lot to um, – can't think of his name. He's the Pittsburgh Steelers girl. Uh, it's uh, uh, Paul Amalo, Troy Paul Amalo. Troy Paul Amalo. And um, he's just been, he's just been feeding off them. He's been getting – and, uh, he's been giving him feedback and, you know, just helping him, helping him in his role that he's going to be playing in. With the so um, I, I, I I would love to see that, man. I would love to see three safeties if, uh, and Womack, Pickle. Um, I think it would be an interesting, um, an interesting wrinkle added to the Niners' defense. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and we've seen them line up a little bit like that in 2019 when they ran Tart more ward together uh, but i think it was a different way of handling it i think this would be a more aggressive style but with D'Amico ryan's i mean these guys just uh he gets after it he's got a lot of creative ways to be able to go after these teams and so far this defense has been absolutely dominant through the preseason and then through joint practices right. and that's without them game planning imagine when they're actually going to game plan to attack the weaknesses of these offenses or to uh disguise the coverages and things that they're going to do it's going to be absolutely nasty so I think that, yeah, these cuts kind of showed us, you know, how the 49ers direction is going. You know, Denard definitely made it seem like, hey, Womack is going to be that guy. He's he's ready to roll. And then I think also with uh, Kim Diche, it showed how much depth the 49ers have on the defensive line, knowing that Robert Kim Diche is not going to make the 53-man roster. That makes me think right away, Warren, that they're probably going to have seven edge rushers and four interior defensive linemen instead of going with a six and five because I think if they would have went six and five, Kim DJ had an opportunity to make the team. Absolutely, yeah. Kim DJ, um, I mean, that's our – Niners are – the strength of our defense is a what? Deep tackle. Yeah. So seeing him get cut to me wasn't surprising because we're so loaded on the defense. It's just unfortunate that it had to happen to him because what he he came from Cincinnati, correct? Uh, he was with so Kim DJ was with right. Par, uh, with uh, I'm sorry the Cardinals at first. That's who he got drafted. He was actually a first round pick. Uh, he's been with Miami, which he got hurt. He didn't really play. Had no stats in that season. And last year he was with Seattle. Uh, like Seattle, so, yeah, right. Seattle. So I, he had an up and down performance. They do some weird things. They were they had had Kerry Hyder up over 300 pounds. So. <laughs> Who knows what Pete Carroll's doing with those guys. But, yeah, I mean, Kim Diche was interesting. Uh, I thought Hockett was interesting, too, as far as the release, just for the mere fact that, uh, I mean, you don't have – I mean, he's been a guy they felt comfortable with playing fullback. I thought it would be later on before they would move on from him. But apparently they felt that they had some injuries at certain spots that they needed to go ahead and move on from other guys. Or maybe they see a position change from somebody like a Troy Fumagalli or one of those tight ends. I know we're going to talk tight ends in a little bit, so that'll be something we can also get into. But we also have a competition going at the running back position, and it's got a lot more complicated because at joint practices, Trey Sermon goes down and grabs his ankle. They're going to be doing an MRI, and at the time of the recording, we don't know what the status is of Trey Sermon, but we do know that could complicate things. Or could it uncomplicate things because Trey Sermon's been one of those guys that maybe hasn't performed the greatest, has showed flashes, but, you know, he's, he's injured. But... Warren, how do you see this depth chart after, you know, the game against the Packers? You know, who do you see as the top guys? Who do you see as the bottom guys? Who's probably not going to make this team? I was very excited to see Trent Sermon. 
Yeah. To be honest, and I know um, <clears throat> after the game, he really didn't get the most rave- raving reviews. A lot of people was pretty harsh on him, but I liked the game I seen out of him. I was decisive, ran hard. Um, you really didn't see the stuff that was plaguing him last year, where he was trying to bounce everything. <clears throat> he was in Shanahan's doghouse, and he really wasn't hitting the hole. Yeah, he you wasn't. Know? So I, what I seen out of him, I really liked. I felt like it was encouraging, and I seen growth. Yeah, you know, from last year. Um, it's tough for him because I mean he's behind Elijah Mitchell, who had a phenomenal year last year. You know where uh, Elijah Mitchell, my how I see it, he he needs to grow a little bit as well. But he was in he was in the Shanahan's doghouse, and he was more of the more of the running back that Shanahan is looking for in his system. Uh, Jeff Wilson Jr. Obviously, he's going to be the number two guy. Um, with him, he's it's just about staying healthy. Right. We just we want to see him healthy because we we all know what what he can do. Yeah, you know, like the guy is he's super talented. To be honest, um, I really didn't like Jeff Wilson Jr. too much. I used to be very hard on him, <laughs> and, and I wasn't too much a fan of him. And then I have a buddy that would talk about him all the time, and it started to grow on me. Like I was watching this game, and I'm just like, you know what? This he's like productive. He's super productive. Um, he does his job. You know, he hits the hole like. You can't really be too you can't get too upset about what he does in his game right you know and then so after trey sermon i see we have t- uh ty davis price right yeah ty davis price i didn't really get to see him too much against green bay i need to go back and see uh how he did out there um but i remember watching this film at lsu i seen some good things i seen some things that i really like too much you know i like his aggressive nature yeah you know the guy he, he runs angry he runs physical you know um my my only issue with him is is finding the hole, you know, keeping your head up, you know, not running up the back of your offensive line. Yeah. You know, that's my my main issue with him, but I do think they have a spot for him on this roster. Um Jamichael Hasty, I like him as well. Yeah. You know, I I love I love our running back room. Jamichael Hasty is so different from the rest of us. Yes. You know, Jamichael Hasty is shifty. Um I, he might even be the fastest out of all of them. You know, so but it, I think it's him or Elijah Mitchell. I think Elijah Mitchell's got him, right. but Jamichael Hasty showed a lot of speed during training camp. Yeah, right. And I mean, you—he's such a weapon out of the backfield. Like you could throw him, throw the ball to him, screens. Um, he's just so effective. You could you could game plan with Hasty in so many different ways. But I don't know if he's going to make this roster. There's just so much talent at running back right now. It, it's tough. I, it really is. You know, I, and I think he did a really good job of going through the guys. Uh, and I think Elijah Mitchell, I mean, if you would have got to see him at training camp, and it's, a, it's, it's kind of stinks that no one's going to get to see him in preseason. You're going to have to wait for Chicago, but you're going to see that growth. Uh, he was so decisive. He was absolutely electric the times he got the ball. And if he has a little sliver of, uh, of room, he's making a big-time run out of it. Elijah Mitchell has been definitely head and shoulders above the rest of the guys in the room. And then you're right, Jeff Wilson Jr. is number two in my book as well. I, from everything I've seen from him, the aggressive style of which he's ran at training camp, uh, the aggressive style, the speed is back. You know, from what we we lost last year, he was not definitely not the same last year after right. the meniscus tear. But right. he looked absolutely fantastic. I was I've been excited about him as well. Uh, he went from being a potentially a bubble player to he's got to be the number two guy behind Elijah Mitchell, and they're kind of do it all guys. They can catch the ball. They can make all the runs outside, inside zone, gap scheme. They can also both block. I think that's nice for the Niners to have. That's huge. You know, the questions about Trey Sermon, he has improved so much. I was a little upset with him at the game for this reason. I seen him be even better than he played in that game in training camp, and it didn't all translate. There was a couple of plays where he was a little less decisive than I would have liked, and this is kind of my coach in me coming out. Um, And I feel like if he would have been decisive, we would be talking about this completely different, and we'd be saying, you know what, how, Trey Sermon has to be on this team. I think that's how close he is. But then when it comes to Jermichael Hasey, you're right, he does so much more because he's a third down back. I think the Niners would like to keep him because he's explosive. He can run you know, the all the screen passes, do all those things. He's gotten better in pass protection. My question for you, Warren, is Jordan Mason, uh, the, the undrafted free agent, everyone's been high on him. He's 5'10", he's 225 pounds, big physical guy, had two pretty good runs, but everyone is ready for this guy to make the team. Do you think Jordan Mason can can crack this running back room, or do you think it's more likely he ends up on the practice squad? I feel like it's more more likely he ends up on the I mean, to me, it's tough to justify five running backs, taking five running backs into the season. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, that's tough. I mean, unless he's – how does he look on special teams? 
Yeah, he, he, he's he's good on special teams, but right. is he better than PDP would be, or to Michael Hasty would be, right. or Trey Sermon? No, I, I think that they're all pretty equal when it comes to special teams. No right. one's gonna you know, give you an extra advantage. Right, right, and that's what it comes down to with him is how's he looking on special teams? Because I mean, you're not beating out Mitchell, you're you're not beating out Wilson, and you're not Sermon. You're not gonna be out Sermon. Day, uh, Ty Davis Price, Michael Hasty. So Michael Hasty's been trying to – he's been back and forth between the practice squad and this actual roster since he's been on the squad. Yeah, that's so true. It's going to be so hard to crack that lineup. Unless there's injuries, you know, that's when we'll really find out, like, how good this depth is. But starting off the season, week one, it's hard to see me see him on the roster. Yeah, and, and that's it, right? If Sermon is really hurt now for a right. while – uh, then potentially it gets a lot clearer in that room True. because more than likely, you, you know, TDP is going to be on this roster. We know that. Yeah. Elijah Mitchell is going to be on this roster. I think Jeff Wilson Jr. will as well. So it comes down to, do you want a third down back with the traits of Jermichael Hasty, whose traits are far different than the th other three guys we just talked about? Or do you want a big bruising running back like you know, Jordan Mason, who's probably pretty similar to what you're going to get from TDP? I think that having a little bit of a change up there Absolutely. is probably what they end up going with and keeping to Michael Hasty. So Trey Sermon, if he's hurt and out for a while, could actually clear up this running back room a lot. I definitely agree with that. Yeah, and so the other room we got to talk about is the tight end room, and it's gotten more and more interesting uh, because Charlie Warner has just come back, uh, and Charlie Warner's been practicing, and that's good news for the 49ers, but they've had a lot of guys you know, that are – are capable now we know george kittle's going to be number one so when we're talking about who the three tight ends are going to be we know kittle's one but after that it gets interesting because you got incumbents charlie warner and ross dwelly who have been staples on this roster now for a couple of years uh, dwelly all the way since you know 2019 when he really showed out but you have some guys coming on the scene that have been making plays uh like tanner hudson tyler croft uh those two guys especially and then troy fumagalli who's kind of been more relegated to the blocking style but who do you think the three tight ends will be? Do you think Charlie Warner and Ross Willie hold on to it? Or is Tyler Croft and Tanner Hudson done enough to unseat them? I think Kittle and Warner are locked. I like that. I think I think they're locks. I think the third spot is up for grabs, and that's where Dwelly Dwelly's gonna have to fight for his position. Um I I haven't got to see him in camp. I know you've seen him more. You know what I mean? You've yeah. seen it. You, how did they look to you? What did you what did you see out of them? Yeah, so Ross Dwelly, mm -hmm. I thought has had a pretty good camp. Uh, I thought he was a lot better in the blocking area than I anticipated him to be because there had been so many questions about him, especially since 2020, right. just in, in blocking. But receiving, he looked pretty good. Blocking was better. And then you had uh, Tyler Croft, who I thought had asserted himself as tight end two with Charlie Warner out because he was getting all the first team reps when George Kittle wasn't out there. Tyler Croft has been that guy. He's well-rounded. He can block and he can catch the ball. And he presents himself as a nice big target in the red zone, something he did with Buffalo as well, where he had three red zone touchdowns. I think Tyler Croft has been that guy. The only problem is Tanner Hudson's coming on. And Tanner Hudson has a real chemistry with Trey Lance because they were on the practice squad last year together. So there's a natural chemistry there. And as a receiver, he looks great. The problem is, is he a good enough blocker right. to be able to make this team? So it's one of those things where you have well-rounded Tyler Croft against two guys who are more known for receiving skills, who they might actually be a little bit better receivers, but are they more well-rounded than Tyler Croft? Right, and I, I think it comes down to what Shanahan prefers. To be honest, and you know how Shanahan, Shanahan is, he's a run-first guy. He is. So in, if you're in his system and you're a tight end in his system, you've got to block. Yep. You know, so... To me, if I was forecasting this this roster, I'm I'm a value blocking more than I am being a receiving type. So um I would I would lean towards Kittle, Warner, and I love Dwelly, man. I think Dwelly has a lot of untapped potential. Yeah. And you really don't get to see it. I mean, he doesn't really they don't really feature him too much. Not know? not anymore. Right. So it's it's really hard to see what the man could actually do. It would, I would like to see him actually go to another team, and then he might star somewhere else in, in, in another NFL organization. But I really like Dwelly. Um, but I don't think he's going to make the run. I think, I think they're finally going to part ways with Dwelly. I, I do, too. I was actually surprised they brought it back. Yeah. Uh, I, thought, I thought maybe they would go ahead and move on from him, but I think they wanted to ensure this tight end room yeah. would be really good. And – I think they're worried about injuries. You know, the same way they've been trying to insulate themselves at all these positions is bringing in guys. Uh, Croft was a big time signing. I thought that really is what pushed this thing over the over the limit because 
as soon as you got a Croft, you got a, a guy that when he was with Cincinnati, he was a big time receiving threat. Uh, of course, he's had injuries and stuff that made him slow down a little bit, but he's still at six foot, you know, six foot five, 250 pounds. He's a huge target right. for Trey Lance. I think Trey Lance feels comfortable with him in the red zone. Then when you go two, two tight end sets, whether it's any of those three guys, Kittle, Warner, and Croft, you have guys that can win in the blocking game and guys who can win with the pass. Now, Warner, still questionable in the receiving game, but I think he's going to continue to improve. But I think those are the three guys. But I do believe Tanner Hudson and, and, and Ross Dwelly are right there. I think what will get interesting, though, is if it is those three guys that we talked about and Croft ends up being tight end three, who ends up on the practice squad, Ross Dwelly or Tanner Hudson? Could it, in fact, be the Niners choose Tanner Hudson over Ross Dwelly for the practice squad? I think that would be interesting. That that would be interesting. That's going to be interesting to see what happens. But, I mean, it's a coin flip. It's a coin yeah. flip, to be honest. Um, something that we definitely want to have to pay attention to. Yeah, it's something to watch in the Vikings game. And I am curious, uh, Warren, what you are most looking forward to with this Vikings game on Saturday. Of course, they had the joint practices where the first teams went after it, got after it, and there was a lot of exciting things that came out of there. There's tons of video everywhere, yeah, including nice. Nick Bosa going off three straight <laughs> plays and, you know, I mean, doing some damage to poor Christian Derisaw. Uh, but that's what happens to Mike McGlinchey every single day at practice, and that's why <laughs> he ends up on people's bad list so much. It's not so much that he's bad, it's that, Nick Bose is pretty darn good. Uh, but I am curious what you are looking forward to from this Vikings game. Yeah, they said Bose had something like six sacks. So it was, it was exactly. some of the footage, it was crazy. The dude looks phenomenal. Um, I want to see more Samuel Womack, man. Yeah. Like, I'm, I ain't going to lie, man. I'm like, he has my attention, you know. And to me, when you are a nickel corner and you're – that to me is the toughest position in football. I know a lot of people say quarterbacks like the hardest position in sport. But to me, corner is when you're in the nickel and you're in the middle of the field one-on-one with Cooper Cup, there's just nothing but space and opportunity. Yeah, who signs up for that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's like you have no help, yeah. you know, it's just your ability. And when you're able to cover a guy like a glove in that situation with that stress, like, I'm impressed. You know, I mean, it's much different from playing outside where you have the 12th man, you have out of bounds. You know, like you have the whole sideline. That's true. Yeah. So – I, I am, like, so fascinated to see uh, what he could do because I heard his play continued throughout practices with uh, the joint practices. With so I'm definitely interested to see what he does in this game. Um, or Trey Lance as well, but I don't know if he's going to play the game or not. I don't think we're going to get any Trey. I mean, right. Kyle Shannon was kind of asked about the, hey, are we going to get to see the hometown guy here? And he's like, no. <laughs> I, he, did, he said he didn't ask me. Right. Um, but even if he did, still no because – you know, you have these really tough practices. You're just happy if you come out unscathed and make sure no one gets hurt. And so you don't really need that work for this preseason game. You're going to get a lot of work for the backups. I don't think we'll see Trey until we get dress rehearsals against Houston. Okay. Another, another guy I'm looking forward to seeing is Javon Kinmo. Yeah. Um, I must say the dude is in shape. He is. Man, like I was looking at him. I'm just like, he totally transformed his body. Yeah. And the dude is just so big of a man. Like you see him line up out there. You're, and everybody that plays football is big. But this guy is big compared to them. Yeah. You know, and to see him in shape and come into the season focused like he has, man, like I'm so excited to see him. Like I really feel like he could be the key for this defensive line. Yeah, he is absolutely mm -hmm. impressive. You're right. I mean, when you see him, like you see Nick Bosa and you're like, oh, my gosh. Like yeah. that, you know, you would have Harbaugh saying he's an Adonis. He makes me feel like less of a man. You right. know, like when you gosh. see – and then you see Kinlaw, and it's like Kinlaw's in the, that same mold, except he's – Huge. Yes. He makes Nick Bosa look tiny. Whenever you see Eric Armstead, that guy's a massive man. Yeah. And then Kinlaw just looks bigger than him. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So you're right. And Kinlaw needs to step up because yeah. you lost DJ Jones. If Kinlaw can step into that role and play that nose tackle and do a really good job against the run and then also provide the same amount of pass, uh, you know, pass rush that we got from DJ Jones. Absolutely. This defense is not only going to take a step forward, it could be the best defense in the league. And you, you talked about Sam Womack, and he's going to add to that as well. But, yeah, you picked a good one because Javon Kinlaw has looked healthy. He's lost weight. He's in really good shape. And he's he's more explosive than he's ever been. And I don't know if you saw the video or not, but the first day of the joint practices, he absolutely put the left guard of the Vikings uh, you know, on a lawn chair. It was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I said this uh, the other day. Is I had a kid that used to play for me, and his name was Tony Beaver. His brother's name was Anthony Beaver. They're twins. Uh, okay. True story, actually. And Tony Beaver was like, ooh, he got folded like a binder. 
<laughs> and that's kind of how I felt watching that. I just kept hearing Tony's voice. You know, he got folded like a binder. Yeah, what that man is doing is illegal. He's just so <laughs> big. Like, I, you know what? I had a chance to meet uh, Armstead and Buckner. Okay. Right when they left Oregon. Um, I got to meet them right before they got drafted. And when I met both of them, I'm just like, these guys are huge. You know, but like you were saying earlier, man, like when you see Kinlaw next to Bosa, you're just like, oh, my God. And I just – it's hard for me to get over it. It's just like, dude, this man is massive. Like, there's not many people – made like that oh you know he was he was built for football to be honest so i'm super excited to see him and what he does this season um this game against minnesota i know he's not gonna probably play too much you that's the type of guy you want to be careful with um i'm glad he came in in shape because that's gonna be less stress on his knees you know and um i just don't want to hear no reports after the game that there's any swelling or anything like that like i want to be super careful with this man like Less as less as possible. Like I'm excited to see him, but let's let's get to Chicago. Yeah, and so far so good. You know, we have last year we were getting those reports, right? He was taking days off, maintenance days. Yeah. But there was swelling and there was things that he was having to manage. There's been none of that this year. Right. Uh, and I think that's a uh, you know a lot of it has to do with the fact they had a very successful surgery. The other part of it is he's done a very good job in his rehab. And then I think yeah, losing absolutely. weight also, you're putting a little bit less stress on the knee. Absolutely. But he looks explosive. Yes. And I think if he can have the season that I think we're starting to anticipate, he's going to cause major problems because when you have these these very mobile quarterbacks and we have you know at least Kyler Murray in the division, uh, but Matthew Stafford's a guy that's got enough of mobility to get outside the pocket and create havoc. But whenever you can collapse the pocket from the inside oh. and you have edge rushers like Nick Bosa, Samson Ebucom, and these guys, Charles Abinahue, uh, it makes it so it's going to be very difficult. And that's what we we definitely need. You know, right. and getting that from Javon Kinlaw is definitely a possibility. If that happens, woo, this defense <laughs> is going to be good. I'm excited about it. Yeah, and I hope Kinlaw does get reps in this game. I think it would be a good opportunity to let him go out there and, and play for maybe like half a quarter, get some reps, continue to work off the rust. And then we'll see what happens when we get to the Houston Texans game. But they're definitely working him in. And they do know that once you get past Houston, you have 16 days until you have to be ready to play against Chicago. And that's a long time. Yeah, it is. It is a long time. Um, I'm going to throw it to you. I mean, who are you excited to see? Um, I'm excited to see the guy, some of the guys I've been talking about. But Quantrez Knight, number one. Of course, I want to see Womack because I want to see a build on his performance. But I want to see how Quantrez Knight steps up in his – uh, a more extended role. You know, is he going to play nickel? Is he going to play in the, in the safety room? They said he's getting some safety snaps. I also want to see the interior offensive line. Can Spencer Burford, Aaron Banks, and those guys continue to build on the performance they had against Green Bay? If they can, we're going in the right direction. And so far through training camp, all I've seen is those guys get better with every single rep. If that continues, by the time we get to Chicago, these guys are going to be a well-oiled machine and ready to go. But I also want to keep an eye on, on the outside for the first time, Colton McKivitz because he's going to be taking those first-team snaps at right tackle. Okay. Let's see how he can play. We've had good reports. I thought he had the best training camp he's ever had as, as a 49er. Um, but we need this offensive line to play you know, really well and get some camaraderie and chemistry going. And I have some question marks around it. But if we can get them going, especially against a Vikings team that's going to be employing a 3-4 defense, we're going to get some outside edge rushes against these, these tackles. Uh, it's going to be fun because I think if McKivitz can step up, then I have less questions about this team. Because right now, the biggest question mark, I believe, on the entire team is right tackle if Mike McGlinchey's not healthy. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. And all the all the reports I've heard, heard about the offensive line is they need to gel. Um, it's it's more, I guess, about reps. Uh, I, I heard it's not been their best training camp, but it's hard to see. I mean, when you're not out there, you don't really know what's going on. But yeah. I mean, when you're going up against Nick Bosa, I mean, you're going up against Kim Law and Armstead and you got this young stud and, and Drake Jackson and Sam Samson Ebucon, like, how good are you really going to look against those guys? Especially if you're like a rookie like Burford or a guy like Banks who's coming into a second year. Uh, it's tough to look good every single play. And I think that's one of the problems with like charting how they do in one-on-ones and charting all that stuff is these guys need opportunities to be able to grow. In practice, you're going to have reps where you struggle. It's not about, you know, not having bad reps. Everyone does. The thing is, are you going to have 10 bad reps one day 
and then the next day it's going to be nine, and then the next day it's going to be eight, and the next day it's going to be seven. It's continual growth and continually getting better, and that's what I saw from these guys in the interior offensive line was that growth. They got better every single day. That's what made me so excited about Burford, is Burford seemed like a guy that was treading water when he first started. It's like He did not know where he was. Uh, everything just seemed so deep to him, and by the end, it felt like he was on top of the water and he was really moving. The guy is, is turning into an absolute shark because he's going after people and handling business. So I've been impressed with their improvement, but I need to see it continue. And I think these reps are going to be so important for them. The joint practices were pivotal to their growth. And now we're going to see it even more in this Vikings game. And I think if this offensive line can come together and get cohesive, uh, they're going to give not only Trey Lance the opportunity to make plays, but also get this running back and running running game going. And then they'll be dynamic on offense. As dynamic as they are on offense, they'll be that dynamic on defense too. Right. And what's so interesting about the about the offensive line is, I mean, you look at the Cincinnati Bengals. I mean, they, they were one play away from winning the Super Bowl, and they have the worst line in the league. Yeah. You know, they give the most sacks in the league. You know, and they went through the whole season like that. So, and I mean, to me, I really don't worry about the old line too much with Shanahan because he leans heavy towards the run. You know, and then there's a lot of there's a lot of smoke screens with Shanahan. Yeah. You know, so he hides, you know, our team's weaknesses well. You know what I mean? So um I'm not too worried about the line. I am worried, you know, because I mean when you have a rookie quarterback, you do need to have an offensive line. They need to protect him. Because you know, Trey Lance is a, believe it or not, like it or not, he's gonna be our friend. He's a franchise for yep. now. So you gotta protect him. But um I'm not too worried about it. Um I think Shanahan, I, I trust in Shanahan 100%. I think he'll he'll put the right game plan together to where the old line is not not getting exposed. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, he definitely knows how to uh, mask, you know, different offensive linemen. It wasn't that long ago that he had, you know, a Fusco playing right guard uh, in, in a Super Bowl caliber team or a Ben Garland coming in to play center. It's not like Kyle Shanahan hasn't put together somewhat of a makeshift yeah. you know, offensive lines before. I think the good news is he's going to have guys now that are capable. They're just young. Uh, so as they continue to get reps and as they continue to develop, he's going to be able to lean and rely on them a little bit more. But it helps a lot when the, the attention of the defense is going to be fully focused, not only on Trey Lance and his legs, but on Debo Samuel. you got to find number 19 on every single play. Yeah. And every time Kyle Shanahan moves him in motion, uh, it's going to make everyone's attention go that direction, which could take some pressure off of this team. It also is going to take a lot of pressure off the offensive line if Trey Lance can make some plays down the field. If he has the opportunity and is able to get the ball down the field, these defenses are going to back off a little bit. They're not going to come after him as much, which is going to make it easier for this offensive line to be able to make uh, blocks in the pass protection game. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, that's where Danny Gray comes in. Yeah, <laughs> big time. That's where he can take the top off of defense, I mean, in any play. Yeah, so. you, exactly. And you know what they shouldn't run against Danny Gray? Cover two. Because he's going <laughs> to run right past all of those guys. Uh, but, yeah, this was an absolutely fantastic debut episode, Warren. Uh, very good. We got through um, some really impressive topics. And I'm looking forward to continuing this all throughout the season. Absolutely. I think this is going to be a fun one. I, I'm, I'm sure the, the 4 Yards Cutback crew is going to enjoy it. I think 4 Yards fans are going to enjoy it because, uh, I mean, it's just an awesome conversation, good episode. I think the next one will be even better. I can't wait, man. I can't wait to see uh, this game against Minnesota. And um, I can't do this again with you. Man. It's been a yeah, we'll be talking about Minnesota next week, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of storylines uh, because, you know, we'll be getting into that Houston Texans game as well. So uh, <laughs> it's going to be fun. I hope everyone enjoyed the episode. We'll catch you on the next one. If you had the opportunity, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, uh, hit that notification bell so you don't miss more episodes of Cover 2. But thank you all for watching. This was a great episode. We really enjoyed it. We'll catch you guys on the next one.